Richard, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, the title of the conference is, as you can see, the, fut the, the Future of Finance and the Theory that Underpins It. And that last phrase is very important. Uh, regulators, policymakers, practitioners can't operate in finance without having an intellectual framework to work by. And the falling apart into, well, and falling into discredit of the efficient market hypothesis progressively over the last decade uh, leaves all three groups really at rather a loss intellectually. What I'm going to do today is outline what is uh, tackled at greater length in the, in the chapters, I'm going to outline uh, a new paradigm for finance and briefly talk about some of the policy, one particular policy implication that stands out a mile from that. The efficient market hypothesis um, has, uh, as you know, the core beliefs that prices are right and markets are self-stabilizing. And that's informed the actions of policymakers, regulators, for instance, uh, who sought to make regulation lighter because the markets could take care of things, the uh, central banks who thought that asset prices were right, that uh, there were either there were no bubbles, uh, bubbles were beneficial, or if they were bubbles, they couldn't be uh, tackled, the Greenspan view. Uh, but it's more pervasive even th than that, uh, the application of the, the theory, uh, because it affects uh, really everything from mark to market, which assumes that prices are right. Uh, it affects the, uh, the view of uh, approval of new products. If they improve liquidity of markets, then that's a good thing, tick, tick. And the same with completion of markets. But be, uh, even more fundamental is the fact that because markets were deemed efficient, there were no academic papers asking why has finance grown so big. It is quite extraordinary. Journal articles submitted to the Journal of Finance, the Premier Finance Journal, were uh, rejected on the grounds, in one case I know, uh, that the editor replying to the uh, author that uh, finance had nothing to say about social utility. The succession of booms, crashes and crunches uh, with their spillover effects dramatically into the real economy lately have brought final discredit to the efficient market hypothesis, leaving no obvious replacement. Uh, in fact, some commentators going around like headless chickens uh, saying, well, it's uh, holding on to efficient market theory or going to some behavioralist ideas, uh, relying on irrational irrationality and behavioral quirks to explain the performance of markets. But fortunately, there is an alternative paradigm that does a better job of explaining reality. It, has, it retains rational expectations and has, gives all the analytical rigor uh, that economists have become accustomed to, and frankly, a good science should have. And I want to talk about uh, the work that we are doing at LSE with Dimitri Vainas and at, uh, the University of Toulouse in my center there, uh, to develop the new paradigm which recognizes the importance of the intermediaries, the agents. Agents, in this case, being the banks, the brokers, the fund managers, uh, actuaries, un Uncle Tom Cobley and all, uh, all the intermediaries, uh, because extraordinarily, uh, the efficient market hypothesis and all the capital market theory, bu theory built upon it over the last 40 years ignores the intermediaries. It assumes that finance is actually a pass-through, and that is why macroeconomic models don't have of a finance sector to speak of. Once you start introducing agents into the analysis, uh, it's like going through the wardrobe, back of the wardrobe in, in, in The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. Everything changes and it's quite fascinating. Uh, and the point is, the, the new paradigm 
that we're working on, and others around the world, but uh, is that the reality is that most investors, and I'll talk mainly about uh, the asset pricing uh, work that we're doing and the relationship between investors, the end investor, and, and the managers, fund managers. Because the point is that most end investors invest through fund managers. So all the pension funds, charitable foundations, and so forth around the world delegate management of their funds to, uh, to, to fund managers. And these give, give rise to problems of asymmetric information. Uh, and apart from the, uh, they uh, contaminate the asset pricing process. But there's a second element also, which I'll also talk about, which is the rent capture that goes on because of the agency problem. But first of all, asset price, in the asset pricing um, theory, um, the agents have more information, their interests are not aligned necessarily with their principles, and that is the source of the problem. When you look at asset pricing, prices get distorted because end investors, and this is key to the work on momentum and reversal, uh, the end investor has to assume that good performance by his manager implies that he's good and therefore, rather than lucky, and therefore puts more money with that manager and takes money away from the underperforming manager. The key, therefore, is that delegation creates momentum which is driven by fund flows rather than fair value. The end investor is giving more money to the successful manager, the recently successful manager. And that may be simply uh, luck, it may be um, the fact that uh, there is um, new information coming out uh, which uh, the prices are just, managers happen to be overweight in that, and therefore uh, more funds are put by the end investor with that manager. And, and when you've got all these responses multiplied uh, across all investors and all asset classes, and we're talking here of asset classes being not just shares, but bonds, currencies, commodities, and so forth. You see how trends develop, trends driven by fund flows rather than the underlying fair value. The underlying fair value is an ultimate anchor, but in the meantime, prices can get heavily distorted by uh, the fund flows. Efficient market theory assumes that prices are driven simply by the, uh, the fair value and ignores that, the, the momentum element. And in fact, Eugene Farmer, one of the architects of the efficient market hypothesis, uh, even recently uh, said that momentum was the premier unexplained anomaly. And what he meant by that was unexplained in rational terms. Because the point is, uh, when you start to look at asset pricing, recognizing the asymmetric information uh, between the agents and the, uh, and the principals, uh, you start to realize that everybody's acting optimally and rationally in their own self-interest. Uh, but the outcome is for distorted prices. And I, this was brought home to me, as uh, Richard said, uh, the technology bubble uh, at the start of the millennium. Um, we were a value, my firm was a value manager, focusing predominantly on fair value. The tech bubble caused us to underperform dramatically um, against the index, something like 20% against the index. Uh, we, in our quantitative models, believe that value stocks were uh, attractive and cheap and continued holding them and underweight in the technology stocks which we believed extremely overvalued and therefore we were fired in fact by 40% of our clients uh, we were dead right in the long run but nearly dead in the short run <laughs> so 
what we show in our, 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 our papers is that the pricing of, of, of assets uh, is a battle between fair value and momentum. The momentum doesn't just occur because of the, uh, the reaction of, of the end investor to under and out performance. It also occurs for a whole set of other reasons. But once, it, once momentum gets embedded in markets, then, as you can see, um, the, there are a large number of investors who will simply focus on the momentum aspect and ignore fair value. They'll ride the, ride the trends. And indeed, it leads to short-termism and great volatility of equities. Equities are, in fact, something like, historically, 15 times more volatile than the underlying earnings stream, both in the US and the UK. A separate result, so that's one result of, of taking into account agents. You get mispricing, distortions, momentum, bubbles, and crashes. And indeed, I, I believe that asset pricing is, is a fundamental building block of, of the whole of finance. And if you have volatility of asset prices, then that leads to a whole succession of problems uh, in wider finance, often aggravated by central bank responses. The sec se second result, which is quite separate, is that uh, delegation leads to rent capture by the agent. Uh, the fee structure is partly to blame. Hedge funds, for instance, uh, are receiving fat rewards for good performance, but not penalized for bad. Uh, that creates moral hazard and encourages gambling. There's also lack of transparency and complexity. There are other routes to, to rent extraction. Similarly, when mortgages uh, were packaged into uh, untraded, opaque, unquoted CDOs, uh, with tiers of agents all taking their bite, uh, th that's another uh, example of opacity where the principal, uh, principals, the end investors, catch a cold and the agents um, cheer to, all the way to the bank. Um, similarly, financial ex innovation. Uh, we've had a lot of innovation in the last few years. Uh, most of that seems to be uh, aggravating the rent capture. Now, financial agents, the, the uh, financial sector in general, uh, performs an essential function. The trouble is that it's at the intersection between uh, the, all the savings and all the investment, not only initial savings and initial investment, but all the, all the secondary trading that occurs in those savings and investments. Their ability to exploit the situation to their own advantage is almost unlimited. They eff effectively can, it seems, uh, bleed the real economy. It, they can bleed the real economy dry. It sometimes feels like that in the last year or two. I don't actually, I'm not blaming anybody for this. Actually, I think that it's the academic theory that said markets are efficient that's been a large part of the problem. It's, endorsed activities, the practitioners have enjoyed it, and governments encouraged it. So, what has remained um, resolute, resolutely uh, at odds with the predictions of conventional theory becomes clear once you introduce uh, a paradigm in which you've incorporated the principal agent problem. I said the, that the asset pricing aspect of, of uh, the agency problem and the, the rent capture had separate origins, but collectively they actually combined to create a perfect storm of distortion. For, and, and really do explain the fact that an industry which is uh, performing really essentially the finance industry performing a utility function of channeling savings into investment uh, has become the largest industry globally, uh, making 40% of corporate profits in the US and the UK in the year before it needed bailing out 
by trillions. It also makes sense of the uh, volatility of share prices um, and the shortening of the horizons, the fact that we're now having uh, the agents doing high intensity trading, um, trading representing 70% of turnover, all done in uh, the twinkling of an eye. Now, it's interesting that the theory of efficient markets has produced chaos and exploitation on a scale that would be laughable if it wasn't so serious. By contrast, the theory that explains dysfunction offers uh, the way forward and offers us possible solutions to promote efficiency. And one remedy stands out above all. Because if you've got a principal agent problem, creating distortion and loss of social utility, uh, in addition to the tax and regulatory work that's being done by the policymakers to tighten up, there's something else that can be done. You can actually get the principals to realize what's happening and to adjust the way they contract with the agents. Uh, the principles here I have particularly in mind are the ultimate custodians of social wealth. They're the uh, sovereign wealth funds, the large pension funds around the world, the state funds, uh, and charitable foundations, college endowments. Um, it's, uh, they, after all, own the bulk of the equities uh, around the world. They have slid, slid into becoming more like another tier of agent rather than the principles they should be. And there are a number of things that they can do to bring the situation to a more satisfactory, satisfactory uh, operation, mode of operation. And uh, they, their, their returns, and, and it, it really means doing something uh, to get them to change the way they behave, to improve their long-run returns uh, for private advantage. They can do that. They, they can make, introduce a number of changes, and I'll sketch out what those are. They can introduce a number of changes which would increase the returns they achieve even though no other funds adopt those strategies. There's a private benefit to them doing a number of things quite differently from what, how they've been doing it recently in the last 10, 15 years. A private advantage improving their long-run return by something like 1, 1.5% 1 per annum. Uh, because their returns, actually, I don't know if you realize this, but your pension funds the last 10 years have delivered 1.5%, that's the average return, 1.5% real over the per annum over the last 10 years, compared with the 5% uh, they were yielding, uh, they were returning in the period, the decades up to uh, 2000. Uh, no wonder large corporations in this country and elsewhere are terminating funds are having to make uh, heavy, uh, um, give heavy support to their fund. Uh, the policies I'll, I'll sketch out would provide a means to uh, improve their individual returns, but then if enough of them did it, there would be a collective benefit. A collective benefit in the form of more stable markets and less likelihood of crisis. The first and probably the most important thing is that funds uh, emphasize long-run investment. It sounds like apple pie and motherhood, but they should uh, emphasize long-run dividends. After all, 90% of the return to, to funds in the long run comes from dividends. The short-run price changes are all noise, but they become obsessed and their managers have allowed them to become obsessed with short-run momentum-type strategies using short-run price changes. The important thing is that funds, these giant funds, should focus on long run and to show they mean it, they should actually put 
a cap on turnover. They should reduce the turnover to 30% per annum at most. The turnover of these funds over the last 10 years has been more, well over 100%. Uh, your pension fund is, is churning equities, exchanging equities with other pension funds at a cost of 1% a year um, for no collective advantage, uh, but a loss to your fund, actually, of your, your pension of something like 25%, 30% over the life of that, uh, um, that pension liability. Uh, there are a number of other things that should be done. Uh, they include not investing in... in Alternative investments, no hedge funds. Hedge funds have only delivered. Ibbotson's work shows, a recent work shows that hedge funds have actually delivered a rate of return collectively no better than the S&P or FT uh, over the last 15 years. It's actually worse than that because investors put money with them after they've done well and they take money away from them after they've done badly. Uh, it's even worse than that as well, because hedge funds um, are extracting alpha. Actually, alpha doesn't go to you. It goes to the Alfa Romeo that the fund managers probably buy. Um, but um, they, have, they have to extract alpha. To, their gross alpha has to cover all their costs, which are huge, borrowing, trading, etc., and their fees. And that is coming out of a zero-sum game, which... Uh, the traditional manager is, is, has to lose to satisfy the identity of the zero-sum game. Um, I don't want to just hammer hedge funds alone. Let me also say commodities are actually, um, should be a complete no-no to, to responsible funds. They deliver only a zero real return in the long run. Long run. You're contaminating the prices for commodity users and, and, and producers of commodities, and you're making... Um, Inflation um, management uh, much more difficult for central banks. Um, and uh, the obvious ones also of transparency and uh, no complexity, nothing off market. It all has to be quoted in public markets. Um, there's an interesting point, and this is a, a nice irony. It is that most fund managers and their, the principles, uh, believe that the market is only approximately efficient, and they've been exploiting the inefficiencies for years. But they actually are using tools developed by economists on the, that are created on the basis of the efficiency of markets. And that actually is, is hugely destructive, in, detrimental to them individually and collectively. Finally, um, I think that the... Policymakers, uh, the one thing I would particularly urge um, the um, governments around the world is to um, all these funds, the, the, the giant funds, enjoy tax exemption um, and you should uh, remove their tax exemption. It lies in the statutes in the UK, but it's rarely applied for 30 years. Remove tax exemption rights to these giant funds if they are trading over 30%. Um, and I think that individual funds could gain something like 2 to 3% long-run return enhancement from doing this. There's a private incentive, a private gain, a collective gain, and it's a nice complement to uh, taxation and uh, regulation. And if, if this isn't done, I believe that the next crisis could spell the end of capitalism as we know it. Thank you. Uh, well, if, if, in case you don't know, you've just heard Paul Woolley's manifesto for giant funds. Uh, um, let's have one or two quick questions, uh, short questions, short answer. Uh, who would like to ask a question or disagree? Yes. Do you want your microphone? Yes. Pick, pick, it up, pick out the microphone from uh, and, under your, it's under your oh, arm. Can you hear? Yeah. Okay. Um, Perfectly rational thing to follow a trend, and if 
that is the source of previous bubbles which existed uh, well before we had a principal agent problem. I don't think the tulip bubble was caused by principal agent problems. I don't think the Wall Street bubble of the 20s was caused by principal agent problem. If that is the case, then your solution may be barking up the <coughs> tree. Maybe what we do need is something which will simply stop the bubbles from coming in the first place, which takes you back to macro prudential regulation. Uh. Okay, that's a lot of, a lot of comment. Um, I would say that uh, there are a number of reasons that momentum gets into the system. Uh, academics, to present a theory, have to explain something in a very formal way um, with rational expectations. There may be many or several ways you can explain it rationally, but uh, the principal agent shows, uh, approach shows quite clearly and uh, how it gets into the system, uh, it, it doesn't, you can say, okay, well, you got herding on top of that. The point is that our paper, An Institutional Theory of Momentum and Reversal, uh, explains very clearly many of the phenomenon, phenomena that have not been addressed or explained otherwise. They explain, it, it explains value and growth, over and under reaction, uh, commercial risk, uh, and to me, it's been an extraordinary re revelation. Um, I um, don't deny there are other sources, but uh, we have to explain why <coughs> there is this extraordinary focus developed on, on uh, momentum. It, once it gets into the system, it, it's very difficult to get rid of it, and that's why capping turnover is undeniably the way to do it. Paul, um, once you've got rid of the alternative investment industry, what would you do with the passive investment industry? That is the sort of epitome of efficient markets theory. Would you allow people to invest in passive funds? Uh, it isn't a question of allowing. I'm just saying that they have a self-interest in not doing so while markets are inefficient. A passive, the index is, is not an efficient portfolio. Uh, the index is potentially sometimes heavily distorted. You'd have put... 50% of your money in Japan in 1990, you'd have put 50% 40, 50% in, into high tech in, in the States in, in 2000. Uh, potentially, it is distorted. Uh, I, I think, without question, you need to um, revise your benchmarks and your risk analysis to recognize that it is the ultimate, it's the underlying cash flows that count, it's the dividend flows, it's uh, to, com to companies and, and to markets. Uh, I am a strong advocate of, the, uh, of, of using GDP, uh, nominal GDP plus a risk premium as the ultimate benchmark for pensions. It, it, it reflects the liabilities of, of funds and it's a good stabiliser both for expectations and uh, I, you've just got to get away from having um, you, you can, it's fine to do passive once, once, once markets have got stable, but well, they're not, you can't and shouldn't. I think uh, probably our time has run out. Fine. Thank you very much. <laughs>